So today's team is comprised of Christopher May, Scott Hendricks, and Jennifer Moon. And they'll be speaking to us today about interpreting and imagining the science of meditation. So Christopher May is an experimental psychologist, associate professor of psychology, and director of the honors program at Carroll University. I'm amazed Carol has you guys all doing like three or four different functions. Um, his area of specialization includes cognitive science and the study of meditation. Chris received his PhD and MA in psychology from the University of California, Davis, and a BA in psychology at Tulane University. In 2012, he received Carol's Benjamin F. Richardson Junior Faculty Science, Jun, Benjamin F. Richardson Jr. Faculty Awards for Excellence in Teaching, Service, and Educational Innovation. Scott Hendricks is a, an Associate Professor of History at Carroll University. He specializes in medieval Renaissance and Reformation history and world history with an emphasis on history of the Middle East. Scott received his PhD in history from the University of Tennessee, his MA in 17th century English history from the University of Tennessee, and a BA in history and English from Athens State University. He received the 2013 Benjamin F. Richardson, Jr. Faculty Award for Excellence in Teaching, Service, and Educational Innovation. And Jennifer Moon is a professor of ph photography and digital media, media at Carroll University. Her photographs have been featured in numerous exhibits and galleries both locally and across the nation. She earned her BA Bachelor of Fine Arts um, degree from, with emphasis in photography from the University of Iowa and a Master's of Fine Arts degree in imaging arts from the Rochester Institute of Technology. So please join me in welcoming Chris, Scott, and Jennifer. Howdy, how y'all doing? Thanks for coming out. Um, if you get us confused, just remember that I'm the good looking one. All right, so you being from Wisconsin, it's probably not gonna surprise you that many good things start with beer. Um, this fellow here is a guy by the name of Bernard de Clairvaux. He's a 12th century monk, tremendously influential in European history. In class, a number of times I've told a story about him, and the real short version is that he had an eye infection, it was bothering him a lot, he goes into a church, he's praying to an icon of the Virgin Mary, so a statue of the Virgin Mary. And he's asking for her help to, to recover from this eye infection. And suddenly she looks at him and she's holding the infant Jesus in her hand and she takes the infant Jesus away from her breast and just sprays him in the face with breast milk. I mean, it's like, you know, a super soaker. Um, <clears throat> he swallows some, he gets it in his eye and he's miraculously healed. My students would always ask, was this guy crazy? No, he wasn't crazy. He was very smart. He was very influential, great writer. Um, but in answering the questions, I started doing more and more digging into uh, mysticism. Mysticism is when uh, people are believed to have direct contact with the divine or a higher plane of existence. And I found that some of the areas of research seemed to me to be lacking. Uh, in particular, the area of uh, understanding the, the role of prayer. Um, when Bernard would pray, he would pray in a very focused manner for sometimes hours at a time. And as I was reading the process that he would follow with prayer, I was thinking, well, this sounds a lot more like meditation. So one night, I'm having a beer, and I had this kind of idea that it might it sounded like meditation. And all of a sudden, I looked at Chris, and I said, hey, you're a neuroscientist. And he said, um, yeah, yeah, I am. And I said, and you study meditation. And he said, yes, I do. So I told him about what I was thinking with uh, Bernard. Um, he was intrigued. We started doing some work together. Next thing you know, well, a few years on down the road, we've got a couple of book chapters, a published paper, um, and a book uh, where we're studying meditation together and mysticism. So that's kind of where this went, and uh, that's how that our co collaboration began, and that's the reason why you have a historian working together with a uh, psychologist slash neuroscientist. And he's going to talk about meditation now. Thank you, Scott. Good morning, everybody. 
So uh, today's talk is going to be a should I just stay here for the video. Uh, today's talk is going to be kind of a high-level overview of a particular paper that was published just last year. Uh, both Scott and I are co-authors on this paper. So the paper, hopefully many of you saw it, it was outside on the, on the table. So we're going to give kind of a high-level overview, but if you feel like your Friday afternoon just won't be complete without diving into some regression equations, you have the opportunity to do that later with the paper. So meditation is very hot right now. Um, we've got a number of people here who indicated they do meditate. Certainly you've heard of meditation. It's been in the popular press quite a bit. So on the screen you have a number of covers of different uh, popular news magazines uh, really featuring meditation. Meditation itself is extremely old, so it's two to 3,000 years old. You find it in many, many different cultures, but it's becoming popular now because there's a science of meditation that's burgeoned, and it's particularly in the past 15 or 20 years or so that's really uh, taken root and now has begun to capture the popular imagination. So meditation as a term is very much like the word sport. So sport doesn't refer to a specific activity. There are many different types of sports, but it picks out a broad class of activities, namely some sort of physical exercise. Meditation is similar. There are many, many different types of meditation. I'll show you some of them. Uh, but what they have in common is that it's a kind of mental or emotional exercise. So there's many different types, but they have this sort of broad umbrella. And we can think of what meditation is doing uh, by looking at a quote from William James. William James is sometimes considered the father of, of American psychology, who's also a philosopher. So William James, in his very popular book, Principles of Psychology, in 1890, said, each of us literally chooses by his way of attending to things, what sort of a universe he shall appear to himself to inhabit. So with meditation, you are doing things with your mind, uh, as you are choosing what to attend to, and the idea is you're cultivating habits of mind that will enable you to have greater well-being. William James also said that an education which should improve this faculty of voluntarily bringing a wandering attention back over and over again would be education par excellence. But it's easier to define this ideal than to give practical directions for bringing it about. So meditation wasn't something that had yet really uh, gotten a foothold in the West a little over 100 years ago. So William James was not familiar with the techniques, although he did have an interest in, in Buddhism a little bit. Uh, he wasn't familiar with the techniques that could do this. And so he didn't think that it was possible. He thought that you were essentially born with uh, high attentional ability and stability, or you were born with something closer to ADHD. So his genetic is innate. He didn't think it was something you could train. We now know that you can train your attention and also emotions, and there's a wide variety of practices. So this is a figure uh, called the Tree of Contemplative Practices, which just sort of organizes all different types of meditation. The particular paper that we're going to be talking about today looks at two different types of meditation. One type of meditation is called loving-kindness meditation, where the focus is to generate feelings of love and kindness. Another type of meditation is sometimes called concentration meditation or focused attention meditation, where you are focusing on your breathing, and as your mind wanders, you simply bring it back. So to give you a little bit of a, a taste of loving kindness meditation, I'm going to guide you through a, a type of loving kindness meditation with uh, supplementation with a video that uh, Jen Moon has produced. So I'm going to have Jen bring the video up, and then I'll walk you through a brief guided meditation, uh, loving kindness meditation. Okay, so if everybody could close your eyes. Get away from Scott, so we don't have feedback. So you close your eyes. <clears throat> so we typically spend most of our time in our head. So we're thinking about things, whatever's happening right now. You're evaluating what's happening right now. You like it, you don't like it, you're intrigued, you're not sure what's going to happen. You're excited to do what I'm about to do right now, or you're apprehensive. You're having all kinds of thoughts. We live in our heads, typically. Uh, let's take a moment to just get outside of our heads and uh, attend to your body. So just take note of your bodily sensations. You can feel yourself sitting in the chair, maybe the weight as you're sitting, pressing down to the chair. You might feel your feet on the floor, your arms on the armrest. You can feel the ambient temperature. Then note if you have any sort of feelings, any particular emotions or moods, even if subtle. 
So just taking a moment to attend to general bodily feel. Okay, now you can open up your eyes. So what Jen has put together is a sort of video sequence of a number of different images. And these are images that are meant to evoke just brief flashes of emotion, in particular positive emotion. So in a moment, she's going to play it. And what I'd like you to do is look at it. But while you're looking at it, don't uh, look at it so much with your eyes, but really uh, have a part of your mind always attending to how you're feeling in response to the image. So if it evokes something, you're just taking note of whatever it's evoking. So you're not simply looking with your eyes, but it's sort of more whole body sort of uh, taking in of the images. So the exercise here is while this is playing to simply note the sort of feelings, emotions, thoughts that are arising as each image displays. Anybody have warm fuzzies? You feel some warm fuzzies? Good. You can stop it, Jen. So <clears throat> that's sort of uh, an introduction to a type of loving kindness meditation. Um, in other types of loving kindness meditation, you're thinking of people. Uh, in the first stage of it, you'll think of somebody who naturally evokes feelings of love and kindness for you. You think about them, you have an image in, in your mind, and then you direct intentions toward them, maybe well, be happy, be free from suffering. So you have well-wishing towards particular images. Here we took physical images, instead of having you imagine one physical images, and then just focus on sort of the little flashes of emotion that each image might have evoked. In another type of meditation, uh, focused attention meditation, what you're doing is you're, it's more simple, it's kind of a classic meditation technique. You're attending to your breathing, so you simply note the sensations in your body as you're breathing. And then when your mind wanders, which inevitably, inevitably does, you bring your mind back. And so you're constantly bringing your mind back, so you're training your attention. And one of the effects that that, uh, that has is that it, it, clears the, it clears perception. So after some practice in that, you have clear perception of what's going on in, in the world, and that's because you're able to see things as they are rather than as mediated through your particular discursiveness and how you're thinking about things and your filter. So you're, you're able to uh, sort of downplay the filter a little bit and just see things a little bit more clearly as they are. So Jen has an, a re representation of that kind of an idea.
So Jen, you want to say uh, how you made this or what we're looking at here? Sure. So um, as the video progresses, and it's short, so I'm going to play it again. Um, so my concept was to uh, merge two different perspectives of the same image. So the idea that sort of a passing image that you may not look at or consider very closely um, after you know, heightened awareness or you know, having a haze removed by practicing concentration, meditation, um, uh, the same scene looks different or, or clearer. So um, at the beginning of the video, it's a subtle change, but it starts off um, filtered. And so I'm using Photoshop to add several different layers that are progressively getting clearer and brighter. So it starts off dark and gets light, but also there's lots of um, subtle changes in the video also. And I have a second one actually also. So a sort of a, a second um, maybe even a little bit clearer. Things coming into focus and being. Right. So things become a little bit clearer. And what's interesting is, you know, in the practice of meditation, we're not aware of the, the sort of film, the cloud, that's making the, our perception of the world a little bit uh, lack some clarity, some crispness. But then once you see that, you can see sort of in retrospect, ah, it's sort of cloudy, right? So you can only appreciate how cloudy it is if you're fully aware of a sunny day. So we tend not to be aware of it until you sort of remove these levels, layers of obscuration. And it's like, oh, this is much more vibrant and, and clear now. So that's one of the effects of this other type of meditation, concentration meditation. I'll talk about more shortly in the paper. Okay, so what I want to do is tell you about some of the, I'm going to give you the key take home message of the talk and then we'll get into some of the nitty gritty. But to set up the, uh, one of the key take home messages of this talk, we're going to have Scott talking a little bit about science and common sense. All right, so, so as you're doing the meditative practice, you feel a lot of things. Um, you know that you're feeling something or you think that you're feeling something or maybe you don't even feel anything at all. Uh, the point about this is that that's all well and good, it's very interesting, but if you want to know what the effects of meditation are sort of more broadly, then you need to dig into a scientific understanding of how that meditation affects a person or if it affects people. And so for that, you have to start gathering evidence, you have to start uh, doing research with people so that you can gather data about the way that it's affecting a lot of different people. Um, one of the, the, the key things about science is that you're trying to get away from just a common sense perception of the world. Uh, because for 2,500 years we've known going back to the time of Socrates that our common senses often lead us astray. Uh, just because you see a stick appear to bend when you stick it in the water doesn't mean the stick is really bent. It means that you're seeing something that's not actually happening. Uh, beginning with the scientific revolution on uh, from the 1600s forward, uh, people who practice a scientific understanding of the world uh, began to develop a way of seeing things that is often at variance with uh, common sense. So, for example, Galileo said, okay, sure, it looks like that everything is moving around the earth. Our common senses, our ability to see tells us that the earth is at the center of the universe, but it's just not true. And so, therefore, in order to get at the truth about the way the world is really working, a scientific approach is to try to ga gather evidence that will allow you to establish a, a, a probabilistic view of the world, uh, a mathematically modeled one, what is likely to be true. Um, and so therefore, when scientists talk about something being true or not true, they often mean something very different than what lay people mean. Um, when a scientist is talking about something being likely true, he or she means that there's a very high statistical likelihood, maybe even statistical certainty. But statistical certainty is a lot different than what the dictionary definition of certainty is. That means there's no doubt that it's true. And the reason why it's important to understand this is because a lot of times this means that there's misunderstandings between scientists and non-scientists. 
Um, a scientist will say all the evidence suggests that, and a non-scientist will often hear that and say, well, this person doesn't know for sure. I've seen on television when people will flat out ask a scientist, do you know for a 100% fact that X? And the scientist will say no. And that doesn't mean that he or she doesn't know anything. It means that they understand just how complex the world really is. And they have gathered a lot of evidence, a lot of data, and they understand that their findings, their way of seeing the world is always open to revision. If it's not open to revision, if it's not potentially falsifiable, if you can't potentially overturn your ideas, that's not a scientific understanding of the world. And so this scientific understanding of the truth sometimes is a little bit different than what other people think about when they talk about something being true or not true. There are some interesting points that arise about this, though, maybe a limitation. When a scientist tries to understand the world, particularly as it uh, deals with people, the scientist is going to gather a lot of da data about the way a lot of different people um, see the world. So you're going to have a sample size that will be larger or smaller depending on the kind of study you're doing. You're going to see how that meditation in this uh, instance affects a lot of different people. But what you wind up with then are averages. What you wind up with are averages of the way that a lot of different people are experiencing the meditative practices. And as Chris is going to discuss uh, in a bit, um, sometimes that can lead us astray about understanding what's really going on there. Because each data point, each bit of evidence means something, but what it means is sometimes a little bit difficult to get at. So for example, um, you might walk outside in August and find that the day is cool. You go, wow, this is a, a cool day. Well, you feeling a cool day, sure, that's evidence that the day is cool, but that's not evidence of greater trends that climate change, for example, isn't happening. Um, and a lot of times people will mistake those kinds of evidence. And you can also mistake it the other way when you look at scientific studies about averages across populations. And then you say, well, what does this really mean for me? So another takeaway that we want to try to give you by the time that we're done here is that when you see scientific studies about really anything, but particularly something that affects you, then you can think about, okay, well, what might this mean for me as an individual instead of averages of populations? Thank you, Scott. <clears throat> so piggybacking on Scott's idea, key take-home message, but something that doesn't seem to, to comport with common sense, most people aren't average. So let me explain what that means. So if you were to look at the average heights of the American male, the average American, the average height of the American male is five foot nine and a half inches. We have a, a distribution there in blue, and you also have a distribution of heights for females. And you see what the average is, but also note that most people aren't, so if we just look at the blue distribution, most men aren't five nine and a half. So the average height of the American male is five nine and a half, but most men aren't five nine and a half. So there's a difference between an average and the individuals that compose the average. This is significant because if you're looking at headlines, whether they're journal articles, the title of the paper, or you're looking at uh, a news piece, they typically report the average effect. So we found that X works. Well, what X works means is that on average this was effective, but that doesn't mean that it worked for every single person. So many of you here are, are likely here because, not just because you have a theoretical in interest in meditation, but because you're thinking, how might meditation be useful to me? So you're thinking as you're sitting there, how do you translate the science of meditation to your own life? And that's one of the, there's a sort of an interesting relationship there between the science of meditation, which typically deals with averages, and then how that applies to you. And it's, there's a little bit of a tension there, but also a relationship that we want to, to highlight. So even though the average American male is five point, or it's five nine and a half, but most aren't five nine and a half, you still are more likely to be around five nine and a half. So if I pick any given male, they're more likely to be somewhere around five, nine and a half than they are to be eight foot tall, right? So the person, most people aren't average, but most people are somewhere around average. So what the average tells you is you're likely to be somewhere around here, even if you're not here specifically. So this is one of the images from the paper that I've given you. 
and it shows the effects of two types of meditation, concentration meditation and loving kindness meditation. Concentration meditation here, CM, that's gonna be the basic breath focus. You're focusing on your breathing. As your mind wanders, you bring it back. Loving kindness meditation, LKM, here in the gray. So this is the more emotion focused one. Looking at people during three different phases. In one phase, they were not doing the meditations. We were just getting recordings of how mindful they were. And I'll show you how we measured mindfulness shortly. And then uh, during the meditation period, so for a few weeks, they were doing one of these two types of meditation. And then there's a withdrawal period where they ceased doing the meditation. And what you see is once they begin doing the meditation, in both conditions, regardless of which meditation they are doing, they have an increase in, mind, increase in mindfulness. So they're more aware of what's happening around them. And then when they stopped doing the meditation, they had a sort of plateau and then beginning to decrease in their levels of mindfulness. So these are, what, it's, what this is depicting is sort of what happens on average. As I'll show you momentarily, many people did not fit this particular picture. But nonetheless, on average, that's what occurred. And so if there were to be a news piece based on this finding, this is what it might look like. So this is, there are fake news generators. So I made a fake news piece. And it would say something like, meditation increases mindfulness. Because on average, that's what we showed, that meditation increases mindfulness. Now, if you were to read that, you would think, I would like to be more mindful, so I should go meditate. And perhaps that's true, that for you, meditation would increase mindfulness. But it might not be true. So there's an interesting relationship between what was shown on average and then what that means for you. So, and this was sort of in the blurb advertising this talk, if science shows that meditation increases mindfulness, that means that if you meditate, you'll be more mindful, right? And the answer is maybe yes, maybe no. So to talk more about uh, this sort of statistical understanding, how science is inherently uh, involved in probabilistic understandings and statistical understandings of truth, we're going to have a little bit more from Scott, and he's going to open up with an interesting clip from Friends. scientist man. <laughs> okay, Phoebe, this is it. In this briefcase, I carry actual scientific facts. A briefcase of facts, if you will. <laughs> Some of these fossils are over 200 million years old. Okay, look, before you even start, I'm not denying evolution, okay? I'm just saying that it's one of the possibilities. It's the only possibility, Phoebe. Okay. Ross, could you just open your mind like this much? Okay. Now, wasn't there a time when the brightest minds in the world believed that the Earth was flat? And up until, like, what, 50 years ago, you all thought the atom was the smallest thing until you split it open and this, like, whole mess of crap came out. <laughs> now, are you telling me that you are so unbelievably arrogant that you can't admit that there's a teeny tiny possibility that you could be wrong about this? There might be a teeny tiny possibility. I can't believe you caved. What? You just abandoned your whole belief system. Mm. No, I mean, before, I, I didn't agree with you, but at least I respected you. But... No, how, how, how are you going to go into work tomorrow? Oh. How, how are you going to face the other science guys? How, how are you going to face yourself? Oh. off because I'm rattly and I make all kinds of noise and I'm sitting around. Um, I mentioned this specific bit to Chris uh, because I had remembered friends and I'm hoping everybody here remembers friends. Sometimes I'll bring stuff up like this to my students and they're like, what? 
What, what are you talking about? I think everybody here knows it. But anyway, um, and I'd remembered this, and I thought, well, this is a perfect example of the difference between a, pers- a lay person talking about truth and knowing something and a scientist talking about truth and knowing something. Um, Phoebe's a lay person. She's not an idiot, but she has a different view of the world than Ross, the paleontologist. Ross, the paleontologist, has to recognize that there's always the possibility that even the most well-crafted, most fully supported theory or notion might be wrong. It might only be one one one-thousandth of a percent chance, but if you don't have that possibility there, then you're not really doing science anymore. And so as Chris and his work and Uh, gathers evidence, he's aware of the fact that some of that evidence may wind up overturning certain key ideas that he has as he moves along. Um, He has to be. If he's not, he's not doing science. But that, again, doesn't mean that scientists don't know anything. What it means is that science is revisory. It's always open to revision. It's always open to interpretation. Um, But... Again, I think it makes things like we're doing today valuable because it allows us to talk about the, the kind of the different spheres that people have between discussing a layperson's interpretation of what truth means and a person's interpretation of what truth means when they're talking about a scientific truth. And I have to point out that just because you do find a bit of evidence that goes against what your, your findings seem to suggest, That single bit of evidence doesn't mean that you're wrong about your ideas. It may give you something to think about. It may just be an outlier. Um, But again, that's a difference in the way that people understand truth when they're talking about a layperson's understanding of truth versus a scientific understanding of truth. So when Chris comes across a bit of evidence that seems to go against what his larger ideas are, It goes into the pile of evidence, but it doesn't necessarily make him say, Oh my God, my entire worldview has been overturned. I just can't go to work tomorrow. All right. And once. (laughs) Okay, so now let me give you a little bit more detail about the particular study that, again, if you want to look at the regression equations later, you can do. So in that particular study, we looked at 30 participants, and these participants were divided into two different conditions. So I had half of them do a practice loving-kindness meditation, and I had half of them practice concentration meditation. And the idea was these are two very different types of meditation that have different goals and different methods. One, the loving-kindness meditation is more emotion-focused. The other, uh, the concentration or the focused attention meditation, sometimes it's called, is more cognitive-focused. So they have different foci. And I was curious if they have, because they have these different foci, do they have... Uh, similar effects or completely different effects? What is the relationship in terms of the effects that these two different types of meditation have? So it took 30 participants, divided them into these two different groups. So for this particular study, our independent variable, the thing that we're manipulating is which condition the participants were in. So whether they were assigned to the loving kindness meditation condition or whether they're in the concentration meditation condition. And then the dependent variables, the things that depend on which condition we put them in, Uh, We looked at mindfulness and then affect, which is emotion. So we looked at two different things, mindfulness and emotion, and the way that we looked at this is by using uh, surveys. So these are self-report sort of surveys. One for mindfulness is called the Freeberg Mindfulness Inventory, and then for affect, a particular survey, it's a validated survey, called the Positive Affect, Negative Affect Schedule. So just to give you an idea of what these surveys look like, what kind of questions that people were uh, answering, for the mindfulness inventory, they're asked questions such as, I'm open to the experience at the present moment, and they have to rate how often is this true for you. And you can change the time scale of this, so is this true for you generally, or in the past couple of days, how, how much was this true for you? So rarely, occasionally, fairly often, almost always. Uh, things like, I sense my body, whether eating, cooking, cleaning, or talking. When I notice an absence of mind, I gently return to the experience of the here and now. So various questions about how aware are you of the present moment versus Um, How often are you sort of lost in the clouds in your head, daydreaming, thinking about other kinds of things? And then the positive affect, negative affect schedule has 20 terms, emotional terms. Ten of them are positive emotion terms, things like excitement and uh, interest and uh, feeling enthusiastic. And then ten of them are negative affect or negative emotion terms. So if you're feeling afraid or jittery or nervous, and then you have to rate... How often, let's say in the past couple of days, have you felt 
this particular emotion. And then you take the 10 positive emotion terms, and you average them together to get an average, get an average score for how much positive emotion they were feeling. And you take the 10 negative emotion words and you do the same thing, you average them together. So that's the independent variable. You've got the two meditation conditions and then two dependent variables, which are the mindfulness inventory and the affect. The particular experimental design that was used in this study is something that's called an ABA multiple baseline single subject design with multiple subjects. So I'll step through a few of these things for you, but again, the, the juicy details, the dry details, are in the paper. So ABA uh, refers A, B, and the A are three different conditions. And so you've already seen this when I showed you the slide of the effects of meditation. There's the baseline condition where the subjects were not meditating. There's the meditation uh, phase where they were meditating, and then the withdrawal where they stopped meditating. So the A refers to not doing the meditation. B is you're doing the meditation. A is you're not doing the meditation again. So there are very different, there are ty different types of designs. I could have done A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. Meditate, you stop, you meditate, you stop, meditate, you stop. This is a fairly straightforward one. So you're not meditating, then you are, and then you stop. Multiple baseline means that the participants, they did not all start the study at the, at the same time. Or I should say they did not start meditating at the same time. So some people uh, filled out these baseline mindfulness and affect surveys for a few weeks, some people for maybe just one week. And the reason for these different time scales is that it decreases the likelihood that the effects can be driven by whatever's happening at that point in time. So if it's midterm time, students are going to tend to report uniformly. And these are students who are the participants in this study. So to sort of try to eliminate confounds such as things happening at particular times, such as exams, you stagger when people are filling out these surveys, so you decrease the likelihood that that's going to be a causal agent in what we're seeing here. And then a single subject design, this is a type of experimental design where you can do it with just one person. And it is an experiment because you have the subject essentially serving as their own control. So they're not meditating, then they are, and then they're not again. So you can see how their meditation, their scores when they're meditating change relative to when they are not meditating. So they serve as their own controls. Uh, the reason that we used a single subject design is we used 30 participants, which I happened to know from some other research that I've done, is not as high of a sample size as you would like. And so that decreases the likelihood you're going to see group effects. But if you have a single subject design, that means that you can look at a single individual and still tell if the experiment, the meditation, worked, regardless of your, your sample size. And then because I had multiple people, why not just do this with multiple people? And then you can apply a certain type of analysis. It's called hierarchical linear modeling, where you simply model each person's time series individually, but in a single model. So you can see, on average, uh, how are people affected when they're meditated and then when they stopped meditating. So to get those kind of curves that I've already shown you. So there are th these three phases, uh, not meditating, meditating, not meditating. The baseline period is one to four weeks. So some people it was one week, some people it was four weeks, depending on when I had them start meditating. For the meditation training, everybody did it for five weeks. So for five weeks, I asked them to meditate four times a week, 15 minutes each time, and they did it at home. I'd given them some training beforehand. And then there's a cessation period where they stopped meditating or withdrawal period. Uh, I had them stop meditating and then continued to collect the same sort of data. And then these two uh, surveys, these data were administered every three days. So I'd asked them, over the past couple of days, how mindful have you been and uh, how much positive and negative affect have you felt? So looking at the results from the HLM models, where you can get an average idea of how people responded, this is looking at affect, which is emotion. So CM here stands for the concentration meditation, the breath focus. LKM, again, is loving kindness meditation, the more emotion focused one. PA is positive affect, positive emotion. NA is negative affect or negative emotion. So down here, these all refer to the negative emotion. And for the most part, the meditations did not have a significant effect on negative affect in this particular study. What we saw more was a significant effect on positive affect, positive emotions. So uh, the subjects felt more excited, more interested, more vigorous in doing the meditation than when they were not doing the meditation. So you have an increase for both the concentration and the loving kindness meditation and positive affect, but this is uh, particularly so for the loving kindness meditation, which makes much, uh, some sense because it is explicitly an emotion focused meditation where you're trying to focus on and cultivate positive feelings, like when you were focusing on the images from Jen's slideshow. 
So you have higher levels of positive affect for the loving kindness meditation, but you still do see an increase with the concentration meditation. And then during the withdrawal period, when I ask the participants to stop meditating, you do see a decrease in both of these, although a much sharper decline for the concentration meditation. Uh, so this leads to a hypothesis that I'm gonna be looking at later, which is that uh, loving kindness meditation might not, might, uh, might not only lead to higher levels of positive emotion, but also something that's sustained even when you stop doing the practice, at least for a period of time. So this is analogous to exercise. You know, if you exercise for a period of time, you'll increase in fitness. When you stop exercising, you're gonna have a decline, but the decline isn't immediate. You don't go to your pre-workout levels with one day of not exercising. There's gonna be a certain rate of decline, but that rate of decline might differ for loving kindness meditation and for concentration meditation. So this is suggestive of that. That's something to be explored a bit further. And then this is the image that I showed you previously, looking at mindfulness, so how aware are you of what's happening in your environments, uh, showing here that both concentration meditation and love and kindness meditation made people more aware of their environments. And this is sort of interesting because love and kindness meditation isn't really focused on the environments. You're thinking about people, you're thinking about emotions, trying to cultivate emotions. So it's interesting that that activity still led you to be more mindful of your environment. And so further research will look at the mechanisms behind that. What is it about loving kindness meditation that even though it's not explicitly focused on awareness of what's going on around you, it still leads to higher levels of awareness. And then you do have a significant uh, change here when you have a, uh, the, the increase, the slope, it no longer increases and in fact begins to decrease. So as I mentioned earlier, these are the averages but now we can take a look at, for each individual person, and there were 30 people, what did their data look like for these three different phases? So we have here, these are, this is a panel plot. So each of these squares here contains one person and their data for the entire study. And you've got uh, circles indicating the baseline when they're not meditating, triangles indicating when they were meditating, and then these crosses when they stopped meditating again. And then I've superimposed on this a sort of a trend so you can see how things tended to, tended to progress. And then the first half of these, so up to through like 15 are the concentration meditators, 16 through 30 are the loving kindness meditators. So if you look at this, just eyeballing it, you can see there's tremendous variability. So there are some people who uh, changed in accordance with the average that we saw. So for example, here we have somebody who appeared to increase in their, and this is mindfulness that we're looking at, increase in mindfulness as they're meditating. And then when they stopped meditating, they had a decrease here and sort of an asymptote. Here we see it even more clearly. So you have a certain baseline level of mindfulness, increases while meditating, and then when they stopped meditating, it went down. But there's many other different trends and patterns here as well. You have some people who appeared to not benefit at all. So they just had a flat line. They had no observable change as a result of doing the meditation. And you have other types of patterns like this one where this person had a benefit and then it just maintained. There was no decrease after they ceased meditation. So there are many people who do not, in fact, the majority of the people here do not fit the mold of the average. So you have an average, the average male is five, nine and a half, but most people aren't five, nine and a half. Meditation on average is effective, but most people don't follow the curve that you have from the, uh, from the averages. So it's interesting looking at this distinction between what's happening with the individual and then what's happening at the level of the average. So for a little bit more of this distinction between individuals and averages, we've got one more uh, visual illustration of that from Jen Moon. So, oh man. Uh, so I was interested specifically um, this idea of truth and how a lay person understands truth, and as an artist, how we think about truth and how we represent truth, which is a far more subjective thing in my field. Um, and so I started thinking about ways in which uh, there we go um, averages are represented and how using a visual means I could think about that. And so um, I wanted numbers to be a part of that. And so in a very straightforward way, um, I used a little man to represent, or maybe he's unisex, man or woman, take your pick, um, to represent the act of meditation and the effect that it, it has on, on a person. 
Um, and so um, I'm, I, you, I filled the figure with a color and then I used opacity to represent um, averages. So this is um, a representation of 50% opacity. So as if this had a 50% effect on someone's life. And the averages, so actually here. So everyone, every figure in this group had a 50% effect. But in reality, as Chris has been discussing quite clearly, the reality of what 50% average really looks like, generally speaking, few people actually hit the 50% mold. Um, and so all of these are the same color, they're the same effect. So I was sort of translating the effect of meditation to a color, which is this lovely shade of lavender. Um, and so a few people are gonna have the maximum benefit and a few people are gonna have no benefit. Um, and I think that that's the part that is so sort of important um, when speaking about truth in terms of science and how we understand it as a lay person. So, so I'm sort of representing the every man, I think. Um, so, and the idea that this can happen in, in so many different forms is the part that sort of sticks out to me in particular, that half of the people could have no benefit and half of the people could have all of the benefit and it could still equal 50%. So I sort of wanted to represent it a few different ways. And then, Sort of finally, there's my last visual. Oh, it's prettier on my screen. And just this idea of you are the lotus. Yeah. Uh, um, and, and the goal is that you know, you'll have the maximum benefit possible for you, but that you may fall into anywhere in the spectrum. So again, this is opacity, so they're all the same, same kind of benefit, but different numbers. So each one of those visuals totaled, if you added up all the opacity and averaged it, it always equaled 50%. Thank you, Jen. And this idea is important not just for the, the science of meditation, but for especially all social sciences, sciences looking at people. So for example, antidepressants. Antidepressants are not effective for everybody. They, in fact, they're on average, they're effective for 50% of people. So 50% of people on average will take an antidepressant and then feel some sort of benefit. Half don't, and so they need some other type of, of therapy. But antidepressants are effective on average, but that doesn't mean it's gonna be effective for you. So there's, a, there's this tension between what is generally effective, what generally works, and then what's gonna work for you. So published reports, including the one that you have, they reflect gazillions of decisions and I'm just going to list a whole series of questions that I had to answer in uh, designing this particular study. I'm not gonna tell you the answers because that'd take a while, but if you're really interested in there in the paper. But there's lots and lots of different decisions that I had to make about uh, how to organize the study in order to get at the question that I was interested at. What is the difference between these two types of meditation and the effects that they have? So why did I choose 30 subjects as opposed to 20 or 40 or 50? How were they recruited? Where did they come from? How should they be assigned to the different conditions of loving kindness meditation and the concentration meditation? Um, should there be a control condition? People are not meditating, but they're still filling out that survey. Why didn't I use one? If there is a control condition, what kind should it be? Passive, where you're just not meditating? Or active, where they're doing something else like uh, some sort of progressive muscle relaxation, some sort of active control? Why did I use these particular metrics for my dependent variables? So why these two surveys? Why not other surveys? or why not other types of measures of mindfulness, uh, such as certain computer tests that you can use to see how easily distracted you are, so why pen and paper kind of a survey? What are their limitations? Why did I choose a particular sampling rate? Meaning, uh, the participants had to fill out every three days what their level of mindfulness and affect was the past few days. Why not two days, why not four days? Why that particular frequency and duration of meditation where I asked participants to meditate three times, three to four times a week, uh, 15 minutes at a time? Why not every day? Why not an hour? Why not uh, twice a week for 10 minutes? Why did I choose those times? Why did I use the single subject design? I told you one of the reasons. As opposed to uh, between subject design, which is more common in this type of, of research. Why did I use these particular statistical procedures as opposed to other tests I could have used? Why did I choose to make these particular graphs? So I chose to make the graph showing you what happens with an individual, each of the individuals, that's uncommon. So commonly you'll just see the average graphs and then 
you'll go from there, but you won't see this distinction between the average and the individual. And then in writing the article, why did I choose to frame it in the particular way that I did? So there's lots and lots of different decisions that go into any given scientific study, and the results sort of stand on all those decisions. They are the, the validity and the value of those results are relative to those decisions that I made. So in short, what I'm trying to say is that an experiment is like balancing a golf ball on top of a pole on your left ear. What? Video. The golf ball off my left ear. This will be the first time I've made a record on my left ear. Or I attempted a record. So in this video, the golf ball are the results. And the results depend on things supporting the results, which are potentially unreliable, potentially fallible. So there's a, there's a tentativity to this, which is why any given scientific field depends on the accumulation of many different studies, because each particular one has this sort of uh, I don't know, it sort of feels tenuous. Good. Nonetheless, it's being tenuous doesn't mean the golf ball isn't staying up there for a world record amount of time. So it doesn't, it doesn't undermine the fact that that is working, right? It just, you see the sort of instability there. So if that's a particular study, then what, how can we think of science in general? So a particular experiment is balancing a golf ball on top of a pole in your left ear. Science, we can think of as bouncing a golf ball, a fake golf ball, on top of a TP. Mm -hmm. So with a TP, you've got many of these different poles, the poles like the pole the guy just had in his left ear, but now they're buttressing each other, and so you can put a oversized golf ball in there, and there's uh, far less concern that it's gonna fall off than the golf ball did when it was on top of that little stick. So you gain a degree, an additional degree of confidence in the findings by having multiple types of studies that are supporting and using converging evidence to arrive at a particular result. So let me tell you uh, some more take-home messages. I'm gonna tell you take-home messages as they apply to science and the take-home messages as they apply to meditation from taking this kind of a perspective. So science is probabilistic, it's statistical, and it points to what is likely true. So it's always falsifiable. For it to count as science, there has to be some way to prove that it's false. Um, if it's not falsifiable, then it's not a scientific theory. So science is always inherently incomplete, and as Scott mentioned early, it's earlier, it's revisory. Uh, headlines, and this is not just of media reports, but also journal articles, what they report are averages. And so if you're reporting averages as they apply to people, it's interesting to just keep in mind this distinction between averages and what that means for you. So maybe that means that you'll feel the same benefit or effect if you take that antidepressant or if you do the meditation, but it might not. Nonetheless, your experience is likely to be close to that average, although it's not exactly. So you're far likelier to be somewhere around 5'9 as a male than you are to be 8 feet tall. So it's going to be somewhere around there, but that, not, that not that exactly. So what does this mean for meditation? Well, the science of meditation should be thought of as inspirational. So the science of meditation tells you what happens on average, but it doesn't tell you what's going to happen to you. So if you want these effects to happen to you, then you need to actually practice and do the meditation and collect your own personal data. So it gives you some degree of confidence that these effects will likely occur, but it doesn't say they will occur. You need to actually do the practice in order to find if these effects do occur. So to put this in another way, um, the science of meditation can yield faith that meditation might be helpful to you. And of course, I very deliberately hear putting science and faith in the same sentence with sort of an and between them as opposed to a but, because that's not something you see very often. So if you're thinking, how do I uh, put this into practice myself? How do I get some guidance and try the meditation to see if it increases my mindfulness and increases my positive affect? 
um, I recommend this particular website, the first bullet point there. So the UCLA Mindful Awareness Research Center, they have a number of guided meditations, love and kindness meditations, concentration meditations, and other types that you'll see. So you can practice those and just see what sort of effect it has on you. Uh, you're also welcome to contact any of us. You have our email addresses there if you'd like some follow-up information. And then I have a website which contains uh, this article, which you already have, but a number of other articles as well, so you could read more about the science of meditation. That's it. So if you have questions, we'll be happy to field questions. That's it. Yes? They were meditation naive, so they'd never done it before. And they'd, and they'd heard of it, but they'd never done it. Mm -hmm. and, and you said that you, you did something. Yes. Exactly yes. Mm -hmm. Yep, so I, I guided them through each type of meditation, through an extended kind of session, and then I gave them uh, sort of take home reminder instructions of, of how to do each practice. And those sort of pithy instructions are also in the, the paper if you want to see those. I have to say that in, uh, in the study, I was very disappointed that at no point did he apply electrical shocks to them. I, that's what I was hoping for. You can't do that in every study. <laughs> yes? Probably not. Um, They probably weren't, uh, like uh, Chris said, but uh, one thing to keep in mind is that the way that most people pray is, please God, don't let, me pull, don't let that cop pull me over. Uh, please God, let me pass this exam. Um, that is not similar to the meditative practices that he was examining. Um, however, a lot of people in a lot of religious traditions do follow prayer practices that uh, I think have to be thought of as meditative. Um, for example, there is a, a, a field called neurotheology where um, uh, people have done fMRI, uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, uh, people who are both Buddhist meditators and they're ex very experienced as well as, uh, in this case, it was Franciscan nuns um, and there were some other monks. And they went through prayer practices that had the similar effects, at least the F fMRI suggested that it had similar effects. Um, as the other experienced meditators. Um, so it's possible that you're going to encounter a student who does, for example, a Catholic practice that has similarities to meditation. Um, but I'm not sure that it's likely. Um, possible, right. though. So there, there are, of course, different types of prayers, so there are different types of meditation. If you're doing an intercessory prayer, where you're simply uh, sort of praying on behalf of somebody, that's going to be different than if you're doing something um, such as a kind of prayer called centering prayer in the, in the Christian contemplative tradition. So in centering prayer, you're trying to really quiet yourself. So you're trying to settle the mind. And the idea behind that is you can only hear the voice of God. You can only hear this sort of, you know, the voice of God if you're quiet. So you have to sort of calm down the noise. So that kind of practice is very similar to the concentration meditation practice. So there are certain types of prayer that are analogous to certain types of, of meditation. Um, those types of prayer you, you often find in contemplative traditions. You find them among, among monks and nuns, um, but you don't, you don't find them amongst students who are Christian. They tend not to practice those kinds of, of prayer. Yes? How did this um, come back to where you started this presentation now with your explanation to your students about um, Bernard of Clairvaux? Um, basically, I work with, with a bunch of different kind of theoretical approaches, including uh, in anthropology, there's uh, something called contextual rationality. And essentially what I argue is going on and what we have argued is going on with Bernard is that he, he did follow these very, um, uh, very rigid practices of centering prayer where he would focus on uh, particular objects such as the icon of the Virgin Mary for long periods of time. Um, he also practiced a whole suite of other um, kind of religious uh, approaches, including fasting, uh, sleep fragmentation, um, and a variety of other things. And so on the one hand, 
One might say that the practices that he followed, he didn't eat very much, he didn't sleep very much, he slept in very tiny little bits, might lead to a particular kind of um, hallucination. Uh, but on the other hand, um, one could say that, uh, I mean, I have no idea, uh, maybe he really is seeing the Virgin Mary. Um, I don't know how that we could test that. Uh, but regardless of what's going on, he's definitely applying practices that are analogous to uh, meditative practices seen in other kinds of traditions. And so you can look at the studies done on, on modern meditators, so to speak, and see how those would affect him as an individual. Um, we've looked at a number of historical figures this way, uh, Teresa of Avia in the 16th century. There's a 13th century uh, 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 nun who we've examined. Um, and uh, I think that it tells us a lot about what was going on with, with these people, and I think that it's something that's been missing in the literature that um, is staring people right in the face, and I don't know why other people haven't paid more attention to it. Yeah? It would be really interesting to replicate the study in a place like a Quaker meeting. Mm hmm Community. Sure. It would be, and we actually uh, uh, jointly filed a uh, application for a, a study project that unfortunately didn't come through for the funding. Uh, that one of the things that we were hoping to do was to uh, kind of examine uh, these approaches in a lot of different modern religious uh, uh, communities. And I don't know, maybe we'll get to do it again in the future. Yes. Yes. Right. Good question. Two responses. So I've done a follow-up study to this, uh, trying to get at that very question of, is one type of meditation better suited for a particular condition or alleviating a particular symptom? And uh, from that particular, so in that case, I had participants do both. So one week they do, say, concentration meditation, the next week love and kindness meditation, and just alternate back and forth while I was collecting a, a battery of data each week about how it's affecting them. And what was interesting that came out of that was that some people would benefit from both types of meditation, but in different, in different ways. And if you looked at another person, they also benefit, benefited from both, but not in the same ways that that first person did. So you have different people benefiting, but benefiting on different subsets of the dependent variables. And then you also had some people that only benefited from one and some people that only benefited from the other. So if taking all of that together, um, I think, and in fact this is supported by some of the contemplative traditions such as uh, Buddhism, that you really don't choose this or that. If you're really getting into the practice, you have some mix of the two. So you're having something like your breath focus and then occasionally you do something like the love and kindness meditation. And so that study seems to support that kind of an idea. Do you have both? because people respond differently. And the other thing I'm interested in is just these tremendous individual differences. So why people are responding so differently, why some people don't seem to respond at all, at least in this study, to the meditation, whereas others did and did so rapidly. So it could be the case, for example, that uh, the people who didn't respond, if they kept meditating, they would simply never respond. Or it could be the case that they were simply s slow to take hold, and the, the duration of the study was not long enough to see that. So there's all kinds of explanations, uh, potential explanations for why it is that we're seeing these differences that could be related to some of those questions that I made decisions on. Right? So I'm interested in follow-up work, trying to examine more individual differences and the different arcs of change that you see for different people and what might be driving that. And so what that requires is more longitudinal studies where you examine people over long periods of time with a fairly high sampling rate. So you can actually, for each person, trace out trajectories and determine a little bit more conclusively if it's having an effect for some people and not for other people. And then if so, are there moderating variables as to why it is for this person and not for this person? There's a little bit of research that was done on this, but very little. So for example, people who tend to brood seem to uh, do better with the love and kindness meditation as opposed to the concentration meditation. Because if you're, if you're brooding, the love and kindness meditation is something that sort of takes you outside of that. Whereas if you're, if you're doing the breath focus, you know, that's not orthogonal to brooding, so you might still have brooding going on. So there are these kinds of things that are just beginning to be studied. 
Yes. Uh, no, they didn't. So that was unique to this particular sample. So even if we're looking at, say, positive affects, positive emotions, in this follow-up study that I did, some people, so if they did concentration meditation, they'd have a certain level of positive affect. And then if they switched to loving-kindness meditation, they'd increase. And then when they went back to the concentration, they decreased. And they went, so you go like this. But other people had that same sort of uh, uh, sawtooth pattern, but flipped. So high levels of positive affect with concentration meditation that dipped when they did the loving kindness and then went sort of like this. So there was a clear causal effect of meditation type, but it was in different directions, which is also interesting if you're looking at group studies. If you're looking at a group study and people have different people experience the effects in different ways, if you're averaging those together, those two patterns are going to wash out so it looks like there's no effect. When in fact, there is an effect. It's just differential for two different people. So with the study of meditation, I think it's really important to look at both have a, what's called an ideographic perspective, what's happening with an individual, as well as what's happening uh, on average with groups. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.